Welcome back, listeners. Johan and I are really excited for the conversation we're going to bring to you today. Uh, as always, we're joined by a very special guest. Uh, so, Liam McNamara, great to have you here, mate. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah, thanks for thanks for joining us and, and giving up your time. I know you're a busy man, obviously running a firm and building a startup is probably enough on your plate. But, uh, you know, it's always good to, to have these conversations for the benefit of the accounting tech ecosystem, uh, especially getting insights from early stage founders like yourself. So, look, for anyone who's listening who doesn't necessarily know you, I'll give a quick background. Uh, you know, you're, you're relatively new on the accounting tech scene, uh, you know, so are we. But over the past few years, I think you've really begun to kind of make a name for yourself. You're kind of standing out as a an innovator amongst early adopters. Uh, you've got an, an awesome firm called Project Alfred, very forward thinking, outsourced finance function, focused on startups and, and growing businesses. You're a serial early adopter of tech yourself, always looking for solutions to your problems, going outside the accounting tech ecosystem, doing things that not a lot of accounting firms are doing. So it's it's not surprising necessarily from my perspective that you know you spotted an issue in your firm and thought maybe I can go and solve this with your experience in tech. But obviously we're keen to understand the journey that you're on. Uh, you're developing, I suppose, a piece of tech in the reporting and forecasting space, which in itself I think a lot of people would say is potentially a tar pit area because there's been a number of startups that have gone down this route. So. Maybe something we can go into is why you think your chances of success are going to be higher than everyone else's. Uh, but yeah, you are the earliest person in the journey I think we've ever spoken to. Uh, you're very fresh in the startup journey. Uh, so yeah, keen to kind of get your perspective, understand the progress you've made, the challenges you've come across already, potentially any mistakes you've had. Uh, so yeah, was there anything else you wanted to add to that intro to, to give listeners context to the journey you've been on? Um, I mean, that was pretty, pretty well, well said in, intro. So, uh, I don't think there's really anything more outside of, you know, um, two years into an accounting firm and, um, wanted to start a tech company to, to solve one of our problems. So yeah, I think that that's probably as much background as kind of is relevant. Yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe, I mean, we talk a lot about focus. So being two years into building an accounting firm, now building a startup, trying to maintain focus on both obviously a big challenge uh, but before we get too far down that route i want to know what what process you went through within your firm itself to try and you know i understand that the tech you're building is based off of a a personal pain point that you're trying to solve or some some difficulties trying to find a solution for it so how 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 far and wide did you search for a solution to this problem before you thought okay i guess i'm going to have to do it yeah, so I mean, I my background is in um, Power BI from um, a while ago, and so uh, I, I could like build out the reports myself and make them all as flexible and customizable and stuff as I wanted to. Um, and then when we, uh, and that was like pre-Project Alfred, then when we um, uh, started Project Alfred, was um, building out reports not in Power BI because the I don't love the delivery method and so I kind of moved on to, to other tools and was doing stuff in Google Sheets and um, then kind of every time a new reporting tech would come out or I, I would spend like, you know, every week looking at different tools. Some I would uh, pay for and kind of go deep on them and see, um, you know, what, what they could do if it would actually solve the, the pain points that we were having. And I'd kind of get to a point a lot of the time and then there'd be something where it's like, this isn't going to be scalable past like me doing it or past doing it for say like 10 clients or 20 clients. Like I wanted something that we could do with a team of people with 50, 100, 200 clients. Like as we, we grow, it needs to not be hard to, to do that as well. Um, but also still get the intricacies of, of, of what we were doing. So I probably would have gone through at least 20, um, different tools and I've got a folder with all of them you know of like the pros and cons like some were amazing and then they were just like a hundred thousand dollars for like one company and you're like okay well that's out um, so there was there was some really good tools they just weren't built for the accounting industry and they went or they weren't built for Australia or so um, kind of went moved past them or or I did I spoke to like um, some of the founders and kind of spoke about what the problems were here and either they didn't get it or they didn't see the opportunity or they didn't want to or 
um, and they I could kind of see there was no point in trying to negotiate with someone like they had their priorities we had ours so um, then got to that point of well if no one else is doing it at, at some point it needs to be fixed otherwise it's just going to continuously annoy me um, and so um, let's have a go at it if, if we can't fix it then maybe it's a not not as big a problem but <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, hopefully it doesn't get to that. But uh, I mean, in terms of the the space that you're in, there's a lot of players who, uh, you know, are out there with existing tools, as you said, tools that you've tested and played with and tried to use. Some of them are doing better than others. But there's also been a number of players who have, I suppose, crashed and burned and and not not made it work. And uh, perhaps are some good examples of of what not to do when going into the accounting industry. What, what do you think? Why do you think you're better placed to succeed than than those other startups that you know many of which raised millions of dollars uh, and they weren't able to succeed? Um, I, I I personally think I understand like what the end client wants extremely well and through what we've built like kind of what we've hacked together ourselves of like because at the end of the day this is almost like a hacked together version or like completing the hack together version, like um, that's just in a nice you know, app form. Um, so, and clients have responded really well to that. When I've shown, like given other accountants access to that um, aspect or discussed it with other accountants, like they're the exact very small problems that we're having, almost every other person has had plus other things. Um, and I think kind of, just listening to what their problems are and making sure we can kind of nail those things will allow us to be quite successful. We're not we're not necessarily like reaching for the, the stars and trying to be like a billion dollar company or anything. We're trying to, you know, be profitable and build a build a good product and I think kind of keeping smaller initially rather than just going massive um, from the or trying to go massive from the start. Um, I think in my opinion, that's probably where we will succeed, that we're not, you know, money hungry, trying to get every dollar. Not that I'm saying other people are, or other tech companies are, but, you know, that is a, uh, yeah, get as much money as you can and spend it as quick as possible is a pretty common thing. Liam, just to jump in and take a step back. Um, so when, because you, you obviously have got intimate knowledge of a lot of the solutions and competitors in Australia and other markets. Uh, but when or potentially what kind of like made you think like, oh, there's a gap in the market there? Uh, or like, when did that happen? Or what kind of like prompted like, there is a gap there, I want to address it? Um, I mean, I guess there was, I probably knew there was a gap for a while before we started um, building any tech. What prompted it was actually something completely separate of a client knowing that we wanted to build it and one of their developers um, who came very highly recommended um, being available and therefore it kind of sped up that that timeline and, and looking at like there was tools that were going to be expensive but we could basically develop something for about the same cost and yes you know there's a time lag but I think I don't think there was necessarily a point in which it was like uh, I've now reviewed this tool and therefore, um, I now know the gap is exists after reviewing X amount of tools. I think it was more, there was realizing that like everything did different things and to get something that was so specific to um, what we're building um, was going to be very difficult without kind of workarounds in other tools. Um, and so it was that kind of other external thing that actually prompted it of like, well, we have this opportunity right now. If we don't take it now, then um, Subham, who's our um, lead developer, like he won't he won't be here in a month. So do we either go now or do we wait and try and find something else later? And and so if this is based on your own personal experience, how what are you doing? How are you making sure that you know you don't end up building a product just for you? but something that, or do you care, you know, number one, or, you know, 
yeah, what what are you doing? How are you making sure that you know you don't just accidentally build something for one person? Yeah, I mean, uh, having having been an accountant in the kind of early adopters hub with you guys and reviewing tech and seeing that process and understanding how how the conversation is different because I've say startups that I've worked with um, that were before early adopters hub compared to after like the line of questioning and understanding that they got was very different before and after or even the conversation I had with them was very different and it was very much like um, you know very congratulated like everything was positive and like no kind of real hard questions and then so I kind of saw the value in in, in doing um, early adopters hub with, with you guys from the other side of like I could still talk to those same accountants because I'm friends with some of them I have good relationships in, in their kind of industry, but would I get the same honesty as like, you know, a thoroughly kind of thought out process? I don't, I don't think I would from, you know, the most part, not because they're not honest people, just because that's not how the conversation, I wouldn't have probably put the conversation down that path. So um, I think to avoid it just being for ourselves, um, we kind of, we did, did that. Otherwise, yeah, it would just be, you know, me making it for me and let's see what we can build and see like what works. What's that, what's that process been like? Not, not our program per se, just the process of putting yourself out there and risking finding out things that you don't want to hear or potentially getting feedback that might tell you to go in a different direction. What's yeah, that I mean, like? It's definitely scary at, <laughs> at points. Like, say, at the, the very first point of not even knowing if people were going to, like, after we had our, like, initial um, presentation and, like, where people even going to um, agree with the point in general, like, just as a basic starting point, is this a problem for other people? Um, that was that was pretty pretty scary to know, like, have we just wasted uh, a bunch of time like doing a zero integration for something that, you know, effectively we probably could do in Power BI and just build for ourselves kind of thing. Um, but then when when that kind of came through, that was positive that it was like, all right, well, now it's the next stage. And then kind of going through that next bit, I think it's, for me, it's always just like scary of like, what, what are we doing things that people are actually going to use and people are actually going to enjoy and do people have the same problems? And I think so far we've seen that for the most part, a lot of the problems are the same. And then some are probably more um, specific to like certain firms than others, but doesn't mean they're any less of a problem. So yeah, I think overall I'd say the process has been somewhat, somewhat scary and um, somewhat like just unknown, like, you know, in an accounting firm, I, know what accounting is and I know that I've done it for a decade and that's like my specialty um, but this is very new and unknown. Liam on, on that with, with that uh, scariness because we, we do see that with a lot of founders uh, and it is difficult uh, you know to potentially uh, uh, basically solicit uh, feedback and insight you don't necessarily want to hear because it could contradict with your your vision so how would you balance or how did you balance that scariness of hearing what you don't want to hear and potentially your vision is is going the wrong way uh, with actually you know getting that feedback and insight and and in the end obviously you you you've tipped the balance towards let's actually get the, the structured insight that I need to hear even if it's not aligned with my big vision but what what kind of like for you tip the balance towards that rather than you know what I have a vision and I'm just going to push it and we'll see how it goes um I think for me in terms of like say building for ourselves versus building for others and therefore like what what would make us go down this path like at the at the end of the day being a non-technical founder like I don't if, if our idea is say this and like the, our design has done this and yes it's kind of has initially stemmed from me, but there's lots of things that other people have done. I don't really take it personally if like that specific idea isn't 
in line with everyone's thinking. I'd more, I'd happily go down a different path. And if there was something that we say needed in particular, that it was just like a, you know, we absolutely need this, then we'd work out a way to make them both work in a way that's like, you know, ours isn't overbearing the overall problem, um, but that problem is still getting fixed. So I think in general, like not taking it personally um, has helped. There's only been one instance and that was more me <laughs> getting down on myself about something. But um, yeah, I, th I think that's, that's helped that I haven't kind of been, as someone who's quite confident and can be arrogant in a conversation or situation, I think this has been very humbling and like, I don't know everything and the amount of people that have given suggestions and you're like, yeah, no, that makes sense. And especially when they explain the reasoning behind the suggestion, I think initially, if you just hear a suggestion, it's like, okay, well, you could just dismiss that because, um, you know, you, you don't actually know the follow up. Um, but then hearing the follow up, you're like, okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, um, I mean, as long as you've got rational thought, then, then you should follow that. Yeah, I, I don't know if you realize, but you have a sign in the background that says stay foolish. And, <laughs> and it probably speaks to the point you're making around, you know, as a founder needing to remain humble and open to the fact that your customer might not think the same way as you and, and a trap that I think we see a lot of founders get into is that they expect everybody to be rational and logical <laughs> like like they are and it doesn't matter how logical you are as a founder if your customers act differently to that or 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 don't want what you're trying to offer them then just continuing to bang your head against the wall with rationality doesn't always work so you do sometimes have to understand that you don't know what you don't know there are unknown unknowns um, and there's certain ways that work better than others to kind of uncover those things. To, to take the conversation a little bit of a different direction, you mentioned earlier on that, you know, you don't have wild ambitions to raise hundreds of millions of dollars or take over the world. Uh, you know, you, you're probably preferring to build a sustainable business, a profitable business. So I'm curious to understand your, uh, your mindset there, you know, why, you think that's the approach you want to take? Why maybe other startups haven't taken that approach? Or yeah, if you see it as an advantage, as a disadvantage, can you yeah. just talk us through that? Yeah, um, I think I think like at a starting point, actually, um, kind of this this aspect came from Francois at Patreon, who kind of said that some some tech companies need capital because they're doing something that requires so much like. Um, regulatory authority or that you need to um, be able to you know fund it uh, and unless you're already a millionaire no one person could necessarily do that compared to say like for us we had an opportunity where we could um, have a team that came within a specific budget and our accounting firm we've like budgeted that for development and I guess from my side like I would I work with a lot of startups who raise a lot of money, so I'm definitely not against raising money. It's more for us um, individually. I probably don't deal that well with like timelines set upon me by an external factor that is kind of not necessarily within my control. And so to put that in place um, whilst we're also building an accounting firm, I think would have been very difficult for us. I don't think we could have... Um, I don't think I could have mentally dealt with that um, very well. Um, and because I, I, I do still want to do both. So it's not like, you know, I want to move out of one and then the other. Um, and I do think you can build tech like we, we've seen from other, I know from other, you know, tech in the accounting industry that has one developer and they've got an extremely good product. Like um, yeah, it is possible to do. I think there's a lot of, people get a lot of money in and then spend it quickly without necessarily thinking through and looking at exactly what everyone would be doing. It's like the industry is like, we need this person because the industry says we need this person rather than necessarily does our business need this person. Um, so I guess coming from um, an accounting firm where we deal with um, businesses every day and seeing what is profitable and what's sustainable. Um, I think that's probably why we 
we made the decision that it, it was possible for us to do it, at least at this, this point in time. So why not? Yeah. And I imagine part of remaining lean and as any bootstrap startup has to be is finding a way to develop your product. That's not going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, especially as a non-technical founder. So what's your process been there? You know, are you leveraging offshore developers? Are they part of your team? Are they outsourced agencies, CTO, co-founder? Can you talk us through your structure there? Yeah. So, I mean, some of it is a bit, um, you know, just built on, built on some trust of like, we say what we're going to do, like we have contracts in place and everything, but like, um, we, we have a team, uh, offshore in Nepal. Um, and as I kind of mentioned before, uh, one of our, um, clients, they have a team in Nepal as well. One of their um, guys who, um, was really good due to his circumstances, couldn't be in that, um, team anymore not anything to do other than personal situation. Um, and so we kind of gave him a, um, a concept and kind of uh, did some stuff up in Figma of like, can you, can you do this? Is this possible to do? Um, and he built a bit of a proof of concept in, uh, two months. We, we kind of paid him a proof of concept fee, I guess, and had a contract with him and, um, at the end of that, he kind of walked through it, um, showed that, you know, this is all, all doable. This is what we can kind of do. Um, and so then we kind of agreed that we would, um, hire, uh, or he would hire a couple of people. Um, I think we started off with, I think we did start, like he hired two people almost straight away, I think. Um, and. I, I did have a, before that I had a conversation with him. There was a pretty honest conversation between both of us of like, let's not screw each other over. I'm not going to, I have no intention of screwing you over. Don't have any intention of screwing me over and let's just not do that together. And, um, I mean, we are both, you know, relying on each other in, in some ways. So it's, um, I guess nice from that perspective. I'm very much a believer in like trusting someone first and dealing with the consequences later, if that doesn't work out and, um, to this point, uh, that hasn't happened, which is good. And I hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I guess that's how it kind of, um, came about, uh, in terms of, I guess, from a non-technical founder, I'm obviously putting trust in, in someone else. Um, and this would apply whether they were in Nepal, whether they were in the UK, whether they're in Australia, like just because someone's sitting next to you, you still don't necessarily know what they're doing is, is the right thing. Um, so I, I am looking into, um, you know, how can we just solidify that and make sure that that's all kosher, I guess, um, which I don't know how to do. I also don't know how to do that and make sure that Supam understands that it's not for any other reason than, you know, just let's protect the idea and make sure that, um, the business is, is sustainable. And, um, so I, I haven't broached that um topic with him yet but um yeah the, I, I i need to do that which i haven't done yet yeah so i mean we've covered we've covered a number of different things how you kind of came up with the the idea from your personal pain point uh you know seeking profitability leveraging an offshore team uh, but i'm curious from your perspective if, if we think about the purpose of the podcast and we think about who's listening early stage accounting tech founders trying to give them insights into you know, potentially some of the pitfalls and, and mistakes that they need to avoid. Is there anything that you can kind of look back even on this short journey and say with a lot of confidence that if you were to do this again, you wouldn't have done X, Y or Z? I think, I mean, it has been very early, so there's not necessarily like heaps of things that could have gone wrong. Um, but I think something that I have definitely overlooked and probably still continue to, to overlook is the lack of like knowledge that everyone in the team has of different parts of, of the team. So like me explaining a fair, what I believe to be a fairly straightforward concept from an accounting perspective is just completely foreign concept to someone else, whether they it's not because they're in um, Nepal, like that same concept would be foreign here. Um, and I think like explaining how to, or w what I want to do, and then kind of it taking a week or two, 
and then kind of finding out that so, like a very small part of it that was kind of fundamental to the rest of it wasn't known and it um, wasn't necessarily asked at the time. That's been, that's probably happened a few times. Um, and I, I think that's, you know, um, that's on everyone for not um, communicating that more. We're getting much better at communicating that and I guess me acknowledging that that's a thing and therefore kind of um, question, questioning back the understanding. Um, we, we did also have one developer who um, was working on something for like a good two months without kind of reporting back. And then there was a bit of lag. He, he's no longer working with the team. Um, and uh, like, I guess probably having a bit more oversight and a bit more um, not micromanaging at all, because I don't believe in that kind of way of doing stuff. But I think because I like inherently trust people, then sometimes things may may take longer than they potentially could. But I, I don't necessarily know because also I'm not technical. So it's like that combination of like um, being being very kind of like allowing people to be very autonomous, but also not being technical can potentially create an issue. I could see I could see it being you know, something could just get, kind of get let slip for quite a while without me necessarily doing anything about it. Yeah, no, that's good. And and I think that communication piece is, is really important and one of the most valuable assets that I think founders get, you know, from, from doing their research is, you know, recordings of those conversations that you might be having with other accountants that, provide the insight that, you know, a product manager or a, uh, you know, a technical team member, developer, senior engineer might not have and just helping them to understand what is this person, what is this accountant going through every day, what is the pain point that they have so that when they build a feature or a, or a new function in the product, they understand the use case. And I think that that role and that communication is is really key to ensuring you don't just end up with some cool piece of tech that doesn't actually solve a problem like too many others uh yeah i actually i actually did that like a you know 20 minute summary of all the market research and stuff so far um and like what the specific um key things that came up were and shared it with the team uh only yesterday um and they really enjoyed like i think i think it's overlooked how much they also enjoy understanding the problem i think um everyone kind of sits in their own area um, where the, they look, but then don't necessarily, or they take for granted what, how, how much someone else might enjoy also seeing, um, like all of that information. It's, it might seem like kind of tedious to you to, to give it to someone else, but it's, it's actually not. So to wrap, to wrap it up, Liam, I got two rapid fire questions for you. So feel free to keep your answers short. One is from your accounting perspective, as an accountant who deals with a lot of vendors, what is one mistake you see too many vendors make? And then the other is our finishing question that we finish on with every single guest is, you know, what is one of the biggest tar pit mistakes that you see accounting tech startups make and that they need to avoid? Yeah, so I think from being an accountant on the accounting side, um, when tech companies don't build if you're building an, for the accounting industry and you don't build good relationships with the accountants and really listen to what um what they're saying um you can lose them quite quickly if you if you do that they'll be sticky for a long time um but if you don't do that it's very very much like oh they weren't they weren't listening to me um these were our problems that i know are problems i know these other firms have problems the same and they weren't listening to any of us um and then probably on the target side, um, similarly in like not listening, but like telling accountants what the next trendy thing will be, the continual term of like compliance is dead. Um, when, you know, even just looking at our p &L compliance, even in a tech forward firm, uh, firm compliance is to our highest revenue. So um, it's definitely as government mandated, you know, policy <laughs> that, uh, that exists. Um, yeah, I think it's something that, you know, tech companies can think, oh, you know, this this next thing is going to be what, what makes us, um, people just don't know it yet. 
Um, but yeah, I don't necessarily think that's, uh, that's the case. Awesome. Good chatting. Thanks very much Liam, for your time and, um, hope there's some gold nuggets in there for anybody who's listening. Cheers, mate. All right. Thanks.